open it up since you're a man. Quiet, please. I'd like to call the board meeting of January 8th to order. Um, in accordance with the requirements of the Open Public Meetings Act, Chapter 231, PL 1975 announcement, I will announce that due to the New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meetings of the public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provision of this act, the School District of the Chatham's Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be published by having the date, time, and place thereof posted in the Board Administrative Offices, sent to the clerks of both the Chatham Borough and Chatham Township, the Library of the Chathams, the Chatham Courier, the Daily Record, the Star Ledger, and the TAP. Mr. Arnick. Here. Ms. Ciccarelli. Here. Ms. Ms. Clark, Ms. Kenny, Ms. Mr. Valenti, here. Mr. Gilfillan, here. and Ms. Weber, here. Four present and accounted for. If everybody would please join me in the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. The first matter of business, obviously, since the election was in November, everyone is aware of the fact that our three successful candidates uh, were Ms. Weber as an incumbent for the borough, Mr. Ryan for the borough, and Ms. Chambers for Chatham Township. If each three candidates can please rise. And raise your right hand. And I did leave you a cheat sheet if you don't want to just repeat after me. <laughs> Wait a minute. You sure? No. Nope. They should be <laughs> yellow forward. Oh, thank you. It's right there. Mary, did I leave it on top for you? I state your name. Okay. Are we set? Raise the right hand, please. If you, I and state your name, please. I do Mike Chambers. Ryan. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support, I support the Constitution, Constitution of the United States, United States and the Constitu Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And the Constitution of the State of New Jersey. And that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I will, I will bear true faith, faith and allegiance to the same. To the same. And to the governments established in the United States, and the governments the governments established established United States, States in this state, in this state, under the authority of the people, under the authority of the people. So help so me God. God. So, so help me God. God. I, 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 Brian, Mary Chambers, so Weber, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, swear that I possess the qualifications prescribed by law, that I possess the qualifications prescribed by law, for the office of a member of a board of education. For the office of member of the Board of Education. I am not disqualified as a voter. I'm not, not disqualified as a voter. Pursuant to RS 19-4-1. Pursuant to RS 19-4-1. And I will faithfully, I will faithfully, faithfully impartially, impartially, and justly perform, justly perform all the duties of this office. All the duties of this office. office according to the best of my ability. According to the best, best of my ability. ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. For the family members or friends or colleagues, does anyone want a photo op at this time with the new board member so that they don't have to stay to the other end of the meeting? Don't be shy. Go ahead, come on. This is your chance to be on television. Now, come on for a photo op. Photo op, photo op. I will if somebody needs a photo. I'm used to taking cell phone pictures. I'm sure that Ed will comply and have you all over the cap tomorrow.
so much. Just the three new board members, because we everybody else is there is in May, which carries for this week. As we complete that, congratulations to Mary, Jill, and Mike. Um, at this time, I will entertain motions for the position of president for the board for the, uh, from now until next January. Any motions? Yes. I'm motion. 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 No, anybody else make a motion? I never volunteer. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I said you can. I'm kidding. 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 Yes. <laughs> Motion as Ms. Weber, president, passes 8-0. I agree. I agree with Matt. You shouldn't vote for yourself. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the vote of confidence. Hopefully I can not disappoint and maybe move the <clears throat> meeting a little quicker along than Mr. Dequilla just did. <laughs> I'm, I was born in Newark. We talk a little faster down there. Um, all righty. So do we have to... Um, we have to motion for vice president, don't we? Excellent. I make a motion for Mr. Gilfillan. Second. Second. Continue as vice president. Mr. DeQuilla, would you mind? Anybody else? Seeing none, Mr. DeQuilla, would you mind? Sure. Mr. Bill Phillips. Can I abstain? No. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Arnick. Yes. Ms. Chicarelli. Yes. Ms. Chambers. Yes. Ms. Kenny. Yes. Mr. Ryan. Yes. Mr. Valenti. Yes. Ms. Weber. Yes. That resolution, or oh, that motion passes in zero. Congratulations. Mr. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, for stepping up again. Um, Peter, do we have to make a motion on the organization meeting actions? Uh, yes, please. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to pass V1 through V2, is it? Yes. Or, uh, Second. I know we have to do it again, May, and, yeah, because the one we moved the election. All right. Uh, the reorg, confirming the reorg and the board uh, committees. Mr. Gilpillar? Yes. Mr. Arnick? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Yes. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Ms. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Those agenda items passed 8 0. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, I do not have a lot of opening comments. I would like to welcome Mr. Ryan and Mrs. Chambers and thank you in advance for the literally hundreds of hours that you will be volunteering. <laughs> um, <laughs> and the friends that you may lose because of this. So mm -hmm. I, I thank you and I apologize in advance. And uh, you know, there's a lot of people that say you should do this, you should do that, but you two have opted to step up and I certainly appreciate it and, and good luck. And please ask any of the board members if you have questions, you can reach out to me or Matt. If you can't find us, certainly any of the other board members are, you know, are, are great resources as thank well. You. So thank you and I apologize in advance. <laughs> so yeah, it's all fun and games till somebody loses an eye. Um, I don't have any additional president's comments because I know we have, a, um, we have our board attorney here who I've asked to um, give us a rundown of, of some additional training and I've asked them to do that in public since we have two new board members and it's been a, a year or so since we've done the training so I've asked Mr. Jacoby to do it on the record in public and we can ask some questions. Um, before that though Matt we're just going to go over to the superintendent's report and then we'll pick it up from there. <coughs> Thank you, Ms. Weber. Happy 2018. Um, I'll be brief because I know that we have Mr. Giacobbe here um, and just say that this is also board recognition month. So thank, thank you all for uh, agreeing to serve as members of the Board of Education on behalf of the 
uh, community and the, the, the students in this community. Uh, like Ms. Weber said, it's a thankless job at times, and um, I know all of us in the district appreciate uh, the fact that you devote so many hours to uh, helping us do our jobs and helping the students uh, get what they need. So thank you. And um, with that, I'll turn it over. Sorry. With that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mr. DeQuilla for a, a very brief um, uh, overview of uh, construction and um, what's gone on since the last meeting, and then we'll go into Mr. Giacobbe. Um, first, I'd just like to report, um, and the notice will hit the website tomorrow, that the next Board of Education meeting, which was scheduled for February 12th, will be February 5th at 7.30 in this courtroom. And prior to that meeting at 6.30, there will be an open curriculum meeting. So the February meeting will be February 5th, not February 12th. Um, very easy on the construction update for our four projects. Uh, the auditorium, the middle school STEM edition, the Milton edition, and the central office edition. Uh, due to the last two weeks of extreme cold weather, not too much has happened on the outside projects. Uh, the contractor at Milton was able to make his connection to the sanitary sewer line uh, right after Christmas, so that's all done. And uh, with the warm weather this week, each of the contractors should be able to resume their outside work. The auditorium contractor is still humming and making steady progress. Um, with most of his demolition all done, now he's starting to lay the groundwork to start some construction and reassemble. Uh, that's all I have, and hopefully I speeded up the pace you know, so that Jersey City can compete with Newark. There you go. Thank you. Um, I do have one question, um, Dr. Lasusa. Back on our last meetings, we've been, we've been talking about the need to redistrict for several months now. And we've, you've talked about hiring a new demographer to help us assist with, uh, whether it's a reconfiguration, um, redistricting, a combination. I was just wondering, have, have we secured somebody yet? I just don't want anybody surprised when we say, oh, we might have to redistrict when it's not coming today, tomorrow, but in the next few years with the growth in, in the Southern Boulevard District, the affordable housing agreements, we know we're going to have to redistrict. It's just the best way to do it, and we want to hire a demographer that you had in mind. How's that going? We did make contact with the demographer. Uh, Mr. DeQuilla and I have a conference call scheduled with him for tomorrow. Okay. Um, I also met with the PTO last week um, to talk about a whole bunch of issues, as we always do, um, but mentioned that uh, we'd be moving forward with a, with a demographer and a look at uh, student populations across the district and with the potential of redistricting. And a uh, question arose as to when if we were to redistrict, and again, that's an if, mm -hmm. uh, when that would take effect. And I said that the most likely date would probably be September of um, 2019. So uh, this year, you know, we, we would have the lead time or the run up for about a year of uh, doing the analysis, planning, finding out more detail from the township and the borough about their uh, housing plans. And we would also be assured that the Milton Avenue addition would be completed uh, because we wouldn't want to move forward with any definitive plans until that construction was done. Okay. Not just their construction, but if 2019 seems just a smidge early, um, if the affordable housing hasn't begun, if Dixie Dale property or the potential at any, any of the borough properties that might be affordable housing or the skate park mm -hmm. housing, which I believe is set at 24 units, Will some of our decisions be based on the, that construction progress as well? That's what we want to speak with the demographer about, okay. in part, uh, how this person would predict and forecast uh, future students and look beyond just simply birth rates, uh, but development of properties and um, turnover of homes. And, you know, if there are a lot of empty nesters in, you know, one particular segment of the town, does the demographer take that into account okay. when trying to forecast six or eight or ten years down the road? Okay. Yeah, birth rate hasn't helped us in the last no. few demographer reports. They've been wrong every single time. I'd rather... I don't know, about 150. Yeah, they've been off by significant... Enough that we've had to hire additional staff, whether it's teaching staff, maintenance staff, administrative staff. 150 kids, one way or the other, moves the needle. You know, as houses are flipped over in the township or the borough, you know, the towns don't have to hire a new policeman, but we have to hire a new teacher. They don't have to pave a new road, but we may have to hire a new maintainer or a trainer or administrator or supervisor. So it has a significant impact on the school district, yes. that type of construction all at one time. 
Okay, um, so you'll keep us posted on how your yes. meetings with the demographers go. <clears throat> so right now you're looking at the earliest in 2019, depending on... Correct, that would at least be the earliest, okay. for sure. Okay, very good. Does anybody have any questions for Mike on... Yeah, just double check, Mike, you, you, you're relaying this to the PTOs, correct? Yes. Perfect. Yeah, it, it's just the... You know, even around town, they're like, oh, nobody's, nobody's talked about redistricting. I literally said the word redistricting at every one of the last nine Board of Ed meetings. So, I, and I'm going to keep saying it because I don't want people shocked that we have to redistrict at some point given the construction in both the borough and the township. Mm -hmm. It was also in the newsletter that I sent in the summer, I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe I mentioned that possibility. Yeah. Okay. And before I move it to Mr. Giacobbe, let me just say that um, we're changing the date of the next meeting um, to try to avoid a conflict with the borough, but we have an open curriculum presentation before the next meeting on February 5th, and the entire hour is going to be d devoted to uh, issues surrounding student well-being, and we're going to have uh, at least one of our student assistant counselors, student assistance counselors, Lisa Latarulo here to talk about uh, suicide related matters amongst our students, substance abuse related issues, uh, and other uh, kinds of significant uh, issues that we deal with uh, on, a, on a daily basis. So that uh, whole portion of the next Open Curriculum Committee meeting will be devoted to that. Right, and, and we're going to advertise that, right? I mean, I'd yes. like, the last Open Curriculum meeting we had, there was literally not a single soul in the audience, not one. Not one person was in the audience. We're talking about suicide suicide prevention, opioid addiction. We are talking about things that impact every single student in the district and every family. So please pass the word around. February 5th, open curriculum meeting, 6.30 to 7.30. And you'll advertise it in yes. newsletters. Yes. And Thank you. Okay, with that, um, as you mentioned, Ms. Weber, we invited our uh, board attorney from our law firm, uh, Matt Giacobbe, to come and do uh, some overview training for the board. You all have to do online training, as you know, uh, on a regular basis, but um, we haven't, I don't think, had the board attorney in in a couple of years, and it, I think it was in a closed session because it was relating to another matter uh, yeah. the last time Matt was with us. So, uh, Matt, you can sit here, you can stand there, wherever you want. I'm fine. I'll You're stand good. right here. Good evening, everyone. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Matt. Nice uh, to see you back. Nice. Thank, it's good to be back. Um, so, T tonight, this is the <clears throat> annual ethics training that board members, um, we, we do this for our districts so that just to give the board members an idea of what they can and can't do. Um, and we do this throughout the, the, the state, but let me just explain something. Board of Education members, when you sit up here as a body, you have a lot of power, a tremendous amount of power. In fact, it, the, the budget that you guys ultimately craft is the largest budget that affects the local taxpayers. Individually, however, an elected board member is a little different than being elected town mayor or town council person. And the reason being is, is that the legislature, uh, when they crafted 18A, which is the statute that governs schools, they did it very differently than when they crafted what's known as 40A, which is the law that governs municipalities and, and counties. And the reason they did that is that they realized in their wisdom that many board members serve on boards because they have children in the school system. And so what they've done is they've crafted laws where board members do not run the day-to-day -day operations. They're elected to make sure that the school is well run. So I use kind of a corny analogy, but the way I look at it is you are all either Isabel or Ferdinand, king and queen of Spain. You buy the ship, you get some compasses, some sextants, and then you hire your Columbus. And that Columbus is the gentleman sitting in front of me. And this is the gentleman who runs the day-to-day -day operations. So boards of education, who do they hire? They hire the superintendent. They hire the board auditor, and they hire a board attorney. Other than that, every recommendation for hiring comes through this gentleman. He has to make the recommendation. You can vote no, but you can't say, you know what, we don't like his recommendation for a business administrator. We would prefer to have our, our uh, friend be the business administrator. It can't be done. And the reason that they do that is they want to make sure that board members aren't going to get too involved in the day-to-day -day activities of the district. So just remember, you have awesome powers when you get here together as a, as a group, 
but individually, when you're out in the community and people come up to you, if somebody comes up to you and says, I have an issue, you're an elected official, you don't say, I can't talk to you, say, thank you very much, my suggestion to you is direct them to the superintendent who can then address the issue. Um, the, the, the reason that you do that is that if you look at um, 40A, the statute that governs municipalities, the, I'll give you a perfect example. If you're in a, a town where the mayor is elected directly, that mayor has lots of powers. They have higher personnel, they can do press releases, etc. Board members in the School Ethics Commission has said that a board member can issue a press release. So the rules that govern you versus what governs the very body that sits up here as the town council are different. So a board member here, an individual cannot issue his or her own press release. You can issue campaign literature, things like that. But you can't take a stand on an issue and speak for the board without the board's permission. And so if a board member is going to write a letter to the editor opposing, uh, let's say, some type of affordable housing plan or something in town, you must specifically disclaim you as yourself as a board member and say, I'm running as an individual, I'm not running as a board, I'm not authorized to write as a board. The town council person doesn't have the same restrictions. And the reason that comes about is you have a, a body called the School Ethics Commission that oversees the conduct of board members. And so what I've handed out to you is a handout that goes through the law and various cases that have come about as a result of board members' conduct or misconduct. And what I tell board members across the state is, if you're unsure, abstain. There's nothing that's that urgent that you should vote on it and get yourself in ethical trouble. You're volunteers, you're serving your communities, you're doing a, a huge service for your families and all the constituents of these towns. So if you're unsure of something, don't vote, ask a question. Because the one thing the School Ethics Commission will not tolerate is if you vote or you violate the law, you can't go back and say, hey, was that a problem? They won't give uh, an opinion on something that already occurred. But the School Ethics Commission will give opinions, advisory opinions, on contemplated conduct. So let me give you a perfect example. I represent a board where one of the board members is um, a former athlete and is now involved through the NJSIAA, which is the, um, the athletic association that governs all competitive uh, athletics among high schools. And she's a competitive coach for swimming and gymnastics and does it all over the state. The issue came up and she approached me and she said, I do, uh, the, not coaching, uh, refereeing, refereeing, uh, these uh, officiating. And I'm officiating county meets and state meets what if one of the students from our district is a participant in that meet? I don't select them, but if they win, you know, the balance beam competition and I'm one of the judges, is that a problem? I said, well, before you do anything, let's get an advisory opinion. And the School Ethics Commission said, in that instance, that's not a problem. You can do that. The School Ethics Commission, more recently, has become much, much more active in terms of conflicts and perceived conflicts. So probably the biggest area for you to be mindful of is do you have members who are in the NJEA? If you have a spouse who's a member of the NJEA, and the NJEA is the New Jersey Education Association, the teacher union, you cannot participate in negotiations of a contract, and you can't even vote on a contract. Even once it's negotiated, you can't vote. You're completely conflicted out. If you have a family member who, um, and that also involves if your spouse is in, it, in terms of your role, in terms of evaluating the superintendent, all different things. So it's very, very important that if you have a family member who's a member of the NJEA, talk to Mike LaSusa and we can give you directions on what you can and can't do. So let me give you an example. If you have a family member, let's say your daughter is a member of the NJEA in a different school district and she's emancipated and lives away from you and has children of her own, you might be able to participate in negotiations of voting on the contract so long as your family member, your daughter, is not in a leadership role in that district's union or on the negotiations committee. If he or she is on the negotiations committee or in a leadership role of that other district's union, you're conflicted. So these are just some of the, the issues that the School Ethics Commission has given guidance on. Uh, another thing that the School Ethics Commission has given guidance on is if you have a family member who works for the district. And I can give you a perfect example. There is a district I represent 
where um, a board member's wife is a part-time lunch aide. So the board member asked me a question, said, can I be involved in um, working on the superintendent's evaluation and review? And I said, you cannot. Well, not a member of a union, the superintendent doesn't supervise lunch aides, but the way the School Ethics Commission looks is if your family member is working in the district, that person who's working in the district is supervised by somebody else who's supervised by somebody else who's ultimately supervised by this gentleman right here. And because of that arrangement, you, if you have a direct family member who's working in the district, you can't participate in the superintendent's evaluation, the hiring. The School Ethics Commission has gone so far as that if you have a direct conflict, you can't even vote on the engagement of a search firm for a new superintendent. You're conflicted out. So it's very important that if you have specific instances, just share them with Mike, and what I can do is give you guidance on what you can and can't vote on so you don't get yourself in, in, in uh, trouble with the uh, School Ethics Commission. And I don't want anyone to have somebody file an ethics complaint against them, especially if you're volunteering. You don't need to have that type of turmoil in your life. There are cases cited throughout here where board members did things that were totally inappropriate. So one case uh, that's cited in here is a board member um, in, not in this county, in a county a little farther east, a little farther, farther than even Newark, uh, more towards the river, decided it would be a good idea to go to the, B, the BA uh, and say, I want to get a list of all the families that live in the district. And they use that list for setting out election mail. Can't do that. That's using your official position to gain a benefit that nobody else could get. Now this was before Oprah existed. Nowadays anybody probably could Oprah lists uh, with appropriate redactions, but what they did is they literally got the entire address list, the database of addresses that was maintained by the business office, and then they used that list to solicit for their election. The School Ethics Commission found that that was totally inappropriate and unethical. Now, what can the School Ethics Commission do? It can reprimand you, censure you, or ultimately could remove you from office. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of one case in which uh, it ultimately ruined, it resulted in a suspension for the remainder of the board member's term, which was, in essence, a removal from office. And it, it's fairly rare that this happens, but it does happen. So I'm going to give you the example. This is a case where you as a board, when you go into the executive session, you can only go into an executive session for very limited reasons. You can go in there for contract negotiations if we're talking about collective bargaining issues. You can go in there to talk about uh, potential acquisition of property. You can go in there to talk about student matters, student discipline, that's all done in closed session. Personnel matters, if you have to punish an employee or an employee's having an issue. Uh, that's all done in an executive session. And the reason it's done in an executive session is it's to protect the privacy rights, really, of students and staff. And in fact, you can't discuss a student or staff member. You can never discuss a student publicly. And the only way you can discuss a staff member publicly at a meeting is you have to give them notice at least 48 hours in advance of the closed session meeting, called a rice notice, and advise them that you're going to be having a discussion in closed session that could adversely impact their employment. And if that employee would like, they can force you, with written consent, to have that discussion in public. And that's the only time you can discuss an employee's misconduct or whatever in public session if the employee specifically consents in writing. So it's imperative that when you're in there, you're, be, you're privy as a school elected official to very, very confident, confidential information. And when it comes to students, there's both state and federal law that governs the confidential confidentiality of students and student records, student discipline. It can't be discussed. So if you ever look at a case, whether it's a special ed case or a disciplinary case, the court dockets use children's initials. They say AL, MG. They don't ever put the child's name. And throughout the entire decision, they never mention the child's name. And that is to protect the privacy interests of that child because they're not of the age of majority. So what occurs is in closed executive session, when you're having these discussions, it's absolutely imperative as a board member that whatever's discussed in closed executive session stays in that room. You never disclose it publicly. You never discuss it publicly. The only time there's a discussion publicly is if it's on the public agenda and there's a required to be a vote. Well, the story that I'm going to tell you is a true story. Um, there was a board member who um, didn't really believe in the whole public 
uh, school system and I think got elected to be <coughs> disruptive and <clears throat> was very critical of the <clears throat> school system and the delivery of education, objected on religious grounds to teaching sexual education in schools, etc. So this board member, one instance, was in uh, the business office and he was rifling through personnel records without permission to find out who was hired and why they were hired, their background, totally inappropriate. But really what, what, what put the nail in the proverbial coffin was that this board member um, did something that is pr probably one of the more outrageous things I've ever seen. So there was an employee who had an alcohol problem. And one day the employee had come, long-term employee had come to school and uh, was intoxicated. Um, they clearly, they called the police, they got medical assistance, um, and ultimately the, the person had to go to the hospital. It was pretty acute. The superintendent at the time, it was an interim superintendent, wrote a letter to all the board members. It said, this is a confidential memo. I want to bring you up to speed. This just occurred today. If anyone contacts you, please direct them to my attention. I'll handle the parents if this comes up. Uh, but please do not discuss it with anybody. Highly confidential. And that was the memo from the superintendent. This board member said, hmm, I've got a good idea. I'm going to take the memo, and I'm going to go to nj.com, and I'm going to post it on the blog. And they did it. They just put it, put it right on the blog to show the type of teachers this district had. Well, it even said confidential, personnel, and luckily the board member put his name. I mean, at least he had the, you know, the, the wherewithal to admit his guilt. That, the School Ethics Commission said, was so outrageous that they violated this person's rights, they violated the directive of the superintendent, the chief school administrator, that the School Ethics Commission suspended that person for a year, knowing there was a year left on his term, which meant he was removed from the board. So the moral of the story is, is if you're privy to confidential information, I can't implore you enough. That is by far the most important thing that you must protect at all times. Because if you don't, then there's, I think there's 60 or 65,000 lawyers in New Jersey. There's a lot of us. Some will find a lawyer and sue you, and you can get sued for violating a student's rights or privacy rights, etc. So it's very, very important that you always are mindful of the confidentiality of, of that. The second thing is you've got to be very mindful of is you can't try to have the board or the business office hire your brother-in-law to do work, uh, you know, a contract, or encourage them to hire a certain insurance broker. No board member works individually. Your power is in this room when you're together as a whole and when you're together as committees. And ultimately, it's the board that makes decisions on the hiring of professionals, on the awarding of contracts, on whether or not you're going to go out for a bond referendum, whether or not you're going to be awarding a, a, a contract to the lowest responsible bidder. That's a board decision. So it's very important that board members don't engage individually trying to make business decisions and business deals on behalf of the board as a whole. Your power sits in this room. Now, the other thing that I absolutely, it, it's become more and more common, and it's absolutely imperative for you guys to be cognizant of, is there's two laws in New Jersey that you absolutely have to be aware of. One of them is called the Open Public Meeting Act. And we're all here tonight because of the Open Public Meeting Act. You have to have at least 48 hours advance published notice of this meeting. It has to be in your official newspaper. You have to post it in town. The public has a right to come, watch, observe, make comments, etc. The reason that there's the Open Public Meeting Act is that whenever there is a quorum, and if you have more than a majority together in a, a room, you have a quorum, you can take action. So right now you have two, four, six, what, one, eight. So if you have five members together in a room, four of you don't, or three of you don't show up, you can vote and take action. But the only way you can vote and take action is if you've properly noticed an open public meeting. You can't have a secret meeting. The only time you can have a meeting without a proper notice if it's a bona fide emergency. And what's a bona fide emergency? The roof at the school just blew off in a storm. And you have to take emergent action to secure it. And then you have to correct it and say, we took emergent action and notify the public thereafter. It's very, very limited. Why am I telling you this? Well, there's this great thing, my, my iPhone's over there, it's called email. And board members 
who email each other with more than five people on an email chain are violating the Open Public Meeting Act. Because you're having five people, five or more, having a discussion, you're having a meeting, you could take action, and the courts have held that that's a violation of the Open Public Meeting Act. So what I advise board members is never re hit reply all. If Mike Lasusa or somebody in his staff emails all of you, you know, the meeting has to be canceled due to a snowstorm, don't hit reply all. What's better, what I tell a lot of, what I tell superintendents is blind copy all the board members so that if they do hit reply all, it doesn't go to everybody. And when board members start engaging in dialogue over email, it, it's very easy for a couple more people to start joining in and all of a sudden you have a meeting in violation of the Open Public Meeting Act. So that's law number one you've got to be cognizant of. The second law that you have to be cognizant of is called OPRA, the Open Public Record Act. The Open Public Record Act is a law that affects everybody who works for the district or who serves the district. And the Open Public Record Act is to encourage transparency in government. So that means that any document that is a business record, any email, any text message, anything that relates to the school is a business record. And if it's a business record, it's got to be maintained in accordance with state law. It's called the Division of Archive Records Management. And it's subject to disclosure. So if you're writing an email or a text, let me just give you a bit of advice. If you'd be embarrassed about reading that email or text in the Star Ledger, don't write it. If you'd be embarrassed or think that that email or text is going to bring you, uh, you know, embarrassment, don't write it. Because what happens is, under the law, people can file an OPA request. And within seven business days, the business office, your records custodian, must produce records. And people say, well, it was a private email between two board members. Well, that doesn't constitute private. What constitutes private is if it's a student record, if it's a personnel record, or if it's attorney-client privilege communication. So if I write a letter to Mike LaSusa, legal opinion, and he circulates it to you, I want you to read uh, you know, Mr. Giacobbe's legal opinion on this issue, that would not be a public record because it's protected under the law as an attorney-client privilege communication. But if two board members are having a discussion about a any given topic, elections, whatever, those are public records. So a lot of people say, well, you know what, I'll just use my private email. Then they can't get it. Well, that's not true. The Government Records Council, which oversees the Open Public Records Act, has held that even if you're using your own private email, your Gmail account, your work account, etc., if it touches on the Board of Education or the school district, that's still a public record. So I encourage board members to use the official district emails. Don't use your own emails. Don't use your work emails. And I'll tell you another real life story. So a district that we represent, um, this was a, a couple years ago, um, got an OPA request. And we'd encouraged everyone to use their district emails only for board business. If you want to do work emails, do that at work. Board, do the board. Don't mix the two together, because this is what happened. The individual worked for a major, major corporation. This individual didn't take our advice. This individual thought it was a good idea, much easier just to have one um, email to check, and was using her official work email for a multinational corporation. Well, when the OPA request came in, guess what? It had to go to the multinational corporation, general counsel, to look at these emails. And the way they find out is you could see the person's email on an OPA request. The OPA request was delivered, and they saw the, the board member a different email. Another OPA request came in. Didn't work out real well for that individual um, because the corporation was very, very upset. So my advice to you is make sure you're using the official email. The second reason is, is the records custodian, Peter, <clears throat> when these OPA requests come in, has to be able to gather the documents. And there's been OPA requests, I'm dealing with one right now, that there are 10,000 pages of responsive records. And so you want to make sure that Mr. DeQuilla can go to your server, get responsive records, emails, whatever the person's looking for, so that <clears throat> they can be redacted and produced. So I think it's a very good habit for you guys not to use personal emails <coughs> when conducting any type of board business. But frankly, what I tell people is there's this guy named Alexander Graham Bell. He invented this thing called the telephone. 
much better means of communication. If you have a question, you can't get involved in the Open Public Meeting Act violations by using a telephone unless you're going to have a huge conference call. So my suggestion is if you have questions, concerns, you pick up the phone, you call Dr. LaSusa, you talk to Joe Weber, and ultimately have conversations uh, via telephone. Because the other problem is when you get an open request, if all you guys are emailing and an open request comes in, and that's how they find out, by the way, if there's a violation of the Open Public Meeting Act. They do an open request, they look and say, well, wow, look, eight board members are having this communication. And there'll be eight repeated emails, because they'll have to do each one of your email accounts, and it'll be the same chain. Then the person will say, well, wait a second, they had an illegal meeting, and the individual who oversees violations of the Open Public Meeting Act is the county prosecutor. It's, a, it, it's governed by the county prosecutor. So it's very, very important that you be, that you be mindful of it. The other thing that I would tell you to do when I started this off is there's nothing that is that urgent, unless the building roof blows off, that you need to take immediate action. So if you're concerned, if you uh, have some trepidation about a certain vote or an issue, or if you could be involved, talk to Mike LaSusa. He can reach out to us. We can give you an opinion. And if there's not a case, and usually there's cases on almost virtually every aspect of school law, but I gave you the example of the one of the, the, official, the official, we have the ability to write and ask for an ethics opinion, an advisory ethics opinion that will give you guidance. They don't, it takes usually about a month to get one, but it'll give you guidance. The other thing that the School Ethics Commission ultimately says is that if you have a question and you ask it and you get legal advice from your board counsel and you act on that advice, even if the advice is wrong, then you're, gonna, you're not going to have a problem. It's when you don't ask and you act that you can't get absolved after the fact. So it's very, very important that you're just mindful of you're voting on budgets, you're voting on businesses. If you think that there's a family member that's on the agenda, if there's a business that you're involved with that, that you know, bids on something that's on the agenda, when don't act in haste. Abstain and recuse yourself. And finally, what does abstain and recuse yourself mean? A recusal means you don't participate at all. So you can't sit up on the dais and say, you know, I really, really, really think this is a great company. We should absolutely hire this company. They'll be the best bank for us forever. And then it goes to the vote. I'm going to have to recuse myself because I have a conflict. Well, if you've participated in discussion, the courts have held, you have now tainted the whole process. And there's a case that came out of a planning board where that exact thing happened, and the court threw out the entire action because the, the person with the conflict participated in the discussion. So if you need to recuse yourself because you have a conflict, you recuse yourself. Say, I have to recuse myself. I'm not going to participate. If it's a closed session discussion, you don't go into closed session. You walk out. If it's up here on the dais, you just say, I cannot discuss it. I'm going to recuse myself due to a conflict. And it's better to have us give you legal guidance beforehand. It doesn't take very long. We could find, you know, we have the whole database of all these decisions. We can give you that guidance. So I don't know if you have any questions or concerns you want me to address specifically. I always have a ton of questions and concerns, Matt. You know that. Um, for, first of all, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, the executive sessions, I just wanted to reiterate, you know, we're talking about student personnel. We're talking about, um, you know, student matters, personnel matters, sometimes very critical, sometimes very sensitive. So that goes without saying. Um, we all have, most of us, sorry Mary, most of us have uh, children in the district, so Matt, can you talk a little bit about identifying yourself as a board member? Mary Chambers doesn't have kids in the district, so I'm going to use her as an example. Mary can't call up and say, hey, Mrs. Jaworski, um, this is Mary Chambers, I'm a board of ed member, I want to talk to you about your special ed program, and I think it's, you know, not going well. Can you talk a little bit about yeah, identification? Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. So, it, when I started this off, I said that the law, 18A, is different. And it's drafted so that you make sure the boards are that the district is well run, but you don't run the district. And so the school ethics commission and the law specifically do not want board members reaching out to staff members directly. If there's an issue that you're aware of, you direct it to Dr. Lasusa, and he will address it, or he will have members of his staff address the issue. And the reason being is they don't want to have the school the, the board members being in a position where they could be intimidating a teacher or intimidating a staff member uh, in concerning a particular program. Now, that doesn't mean as a parent you give up your right to go meet with your teacher. You can always meet with your teacher, but you never, ever say, 
you know, I'm a board member. And I've had that happen. People walk in and say, you know, I am a board member, so you better make sure you're doing a good job for Johnny. That's totally inappropriate. That would be an ethics violation. You can be a mom and a dad, and if you have to go in and see your, your uh, child's teacher, like I've had to do frequently with my four kids, you go in and see them. You don't say, I'm a board member. You're there as a parent, not as a board member. And what I would tell you is that if you're uncomfortable about a situation, if you think that a teacher uh, is being unusually harsh on your child, et cetera, um, and that's happened in certain districts where you know, there's contentious contractual negotiations and a board member feels that maybe a teacher is retaliating against him or her, don't take the matter into your own hands. Again, reach out to Dr. LaSusa and let Dr. LaSusa address it um, and not get yourself involved. The School Ethics Commission has actually gone so far where it says that not only do they not want you involved in directing staff or making inquiries, they've actually also discouraged board members from being active volunteers in the district. So can you be a passive volunteer? What does that mean? Yeah, your kid's going on a field trip uh, and they need a chaperone. You can do that. But they don't want a board member to be the head of a school school's PTO and organize um, you know, benefits for the teachers and be overly involved. And the reason being, and what the School Ethics Commission has said is, we don't want to be, have a board member being that present in the school where teachers or staff members might feel either A, intimidated, or feel that they have to do something special for that board member or the board member's children. So there's really a separation. Like I said before, you are the king and queen of Spain. You're over in Spain. You're running it. It's your show, but you've hired somebody to run the day-to-day -day operations. And so if something comes to you that involves day-to-day -day operations, don't take the matter in your own hands. Direct it back to Dr. LaSusa so that he can have the appropriate person, if not himself, address the situation. And, and can you touch a little bit on social media, either board members, spouses, children, uh, you know, you know Bob Weber oh on my Facebook. Oh, my God. <laughs> Facebook. Twitter, I mean, my goodness, what the world's become. Um, you have to be very, very careful on Facebook and Twitter. I personally don't have any of them. I won't even go on them. I actually sold my Facebook stock because I'm so, it, it, I've seen it ruin so many lives. Not Facebook itself, but what people post. Because people start posting things, and I'll give you a real life case. I just wrote an article over the weekend on this. There was a case in Patterson, New Jersey, and a teacher was assigned to the first grade. And her students, she had 23 students, I know the facts because I read the case over the weekend, 23 students, African American and Latinos. And she posted on her Facebook page, her private Facebook, um, that uh, I'm so glad I'm meeting my, the next batch of future criminals, these are first graders, and maybe we should bring these kids, these first graders, to a scared straight program. Well, needless to say, it didn't work out real well for the teacher. Now, she alleged she had a First Amendment right. The court said, no, you didn't. It touched upon your employment. You're fired. She lost her job. I cannot tell you how many board members, how many elected officials in this state, governors, I mean, we've seen it, both parties, when they write or do something, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's in an email, whether it's on Twitter, like I said before, if you think you would be embarrassed about reading it on the front page of the Star Ledger, don't write it. You're now elected officials, so you have to be very, very mindful of what you're writing on Facebook. You can't talk about the school district. You can't have comments. If you're going to make a comment, my suggestion to you is don't. If you have a Facebook account, make it private for your family only. Do not have a public Facebook account. There are elected officials who like to have their own Twitter or their own Facebook so that they can tell the world how great they are. Your role is a little bit different. You're not the mayor of a town. Lots of mayors do that. County executives do that because they're, they're trying to show their constituents, look what I'm doing so I can get reelected. You guys really can't do that. And the School Ethics Commission has said if you're going to take a, a position on an issue, you have to specifically disclaim that you're not writing on behalf of the board, you're writing as your, your own individual self. And clearly, if you disagree with a, uh, an issue on the board, you can't go on Facebook and say, last night the board voted X and I disagree with it. That would be inappropriate. That would be unethical. Your job 
is if you disagree with something and you want to vote no on something, you do it in this room. You make your comment, say, I don't agree with that, I can't support that issue, that's your comment, it's here at the public meeting. You don't conduct public meetings on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, etc. And there's been many, many board members and uh, elected officials who end up not being able to serve on a board or have to resign in disgrace because of things that they've posted, even if it has nothing to do with the Board of Education. Um, there's one case where uh, a, uh, during, prior to the last election, uh, a board member in South Jersey uh, had a private Twitter, or had a Twitter account. No one on the board had, knew anything about it. And the Twitter account um, was very, um, let's say, kind of to the right. Uh, it was not, you know, CNN or NBC. It kind of made Fox News, right of Fox News. And this person was trying to, you know, I guess become the darling of a certain constituent group. I uh, was writing things, especially in the heat of the election. And we were involved in very, very difficult contract negotiations. And the NGA rep came up to me. We were in, went to mediation, and he said, this is going to get ugly. I said, what do you mean it's going to get ugly? He goes, it's going to get, this is going to get real ugly. So I figured, you know, they're going to, you know, wear red shirts and buttons, settle now, et cetera. That's typically what would happen with, you know, tough contract negotiations. And then all of a sudden, what got ugly was is they were aware of this Twitter account. And it made national news. And the person ultimately had to resign. But it adversely affected his business, contracts, everything, because he had said things that different groups were very offended by. And so... You don't know what you're writing, who's looking at it. So my suggestion to you is just don't do it. It's not worth it. The school should have an official, do you have a Facebook page or a Twitter or anything like that? The district is not. The district is not. Well, if you're going to have one, have an official one and just use that. I'm not even a big fan of that because the other problem, too, is that people, when they type on emails or Twitter or Facebook, it's as if they're engaging in conversation and they don't control. They don't say, wait a second, let me look over that posting before I hit send or enter. And it gets posted and then you're not going to delete it. And many, many people say things in anger and haste and then it's out there for the public. So I think the best course of action is to just absolutely refrain from that. And if you're going to have a Facebook or this, make it private for just your family and friends. But always be mindful that people are looking at it, and you have to be cognizant that you as an elected official have to be very careful what you do and say on those social media sites, and in your emails, and in any communications that you have. What about a spouse making a comment, you know, Mr. Weber going on his Facebook and saying, you know, I can't believe LaSusa agreed to open campus, and I think he's a knucklehead and he should be fired. Well, I, I, I can't help with, you know, marital issues, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't think practice that. Milk, so. <laughs> no, but I think that, it, that it's important. You, what? you, I know, I'm just asking, you, I want, you, you can't control, I mean, it, it's somebody who's not an elected official, if it's your spouse, mm -hmm. he or she has the right First Amendment to say or do what they want, but it will reflect on you as an elected official. And where people get in trouble is when that spouse starts espousing things that were of a confidential nature that they shouldn't be aware of. Because what happens in the closed executive session room, mm -hmm. it has to stay in the room. You don't even share it with your spouse, just for that reason. Um, so I think you have to be very mindful that if your spouse, you can't have your spouse be your surrogate to say something to avoid it. If they're talking about the school, et cetera, I, I'm not aware of a school ethics uh, decision directly on point, but I think if they start looking into it, and nowadays it's pretty easy. They'll just do an Oprah, somebody will do an Oprah request and get all your emails and see text messages between you and your spouse on this issue, they'll say, ah, it wasn't really Matt Giacobbe, it was really his wife who was the elected official telling me to write it. Right. So I'd be very, very mindful of that. Okay, and can you touch a little bit on the financial implications to the district for some of these missteps, lawsuits and things? Well, like that? so the, the um, violations of privacy rights is probably the, the biggest exposure you have. If you violate a student's privacy rights or a staff member's privacy rights, you reveal confidential, embarrassing information that you're privy to, whether it's medical records, whether it's student discipline, whether it's an harassment, intimidation, and bullying, and you reveal that, you can be sued 
Uh, the board can be sued, and you as a board member, if you're doing it, can be sued. Now, 18A has a statute that says board members have to be indemnified, as do district employees, if they're acting in their official capacity. You're not acting in your official capacity if you're knowingly disclosing confidential information. So your carrier, your insurance carrier, could say, wait a second, that was not an, an authorized action that you took. So for you to protect yourself and the district from potential litigation, you have to be mindful of protecting the privacy rights of students and staff whenever you're discussing them. Um, the other thing that you have to be mindful of is OPRA, under the Open Public Records Act, and this is, a, a, tell you a, a, another true story, the Open Public Records Act, when somebody does an OPRA request, Peter has seven days to respond, seven business days to respond and provide documents unless you seek an extension. So if they seek 30,000 pages of emails, you can help narrow it down and try to get to a manageable thing, and you can get a reasonable extension, maybe 30 days to produce these documents. If you fail to turn over documents that are responsive to an open request, and the requester files a lawsuit in Superior Court of New Jersey, there's a case that came out of Hoboken, Mason versus Hoboken, it says if that lawsuit is the catalyst for producing additional documents, then the board has to pay all the legal fees of the requester. There's now a whole cottage industry in New Jersey of attorneys and individuals who file up requests, and if you don't produce the documents, they sue you. And that's why I said it's imperative that you use the district email, because there was a case where an individual board member was using a different email. And the person who made the OPA request was cognizant of that. No one else did this, but there was Facebook posts, etc., on a very controversial issue. They did the OPA request. The records custodian went through all the emails of the district, turned them all over, and a lawsuit ensued. And in the lawsuit, attached to it was this board member's email from a Gmail account that the co records custodian could never have had. In that instance, the district, because they didn't produce that responsive record, they touched on board business, they were held liable to pay all the attorney's fees of the requester. So those are just a few of the areas that you can, and it, it's easily avoided. If you're concerned about it, you pick up the phone and you ask Dr. LaSusa. If you're co um, privy to confidential information, and in almost every meeting that you're at as a board member, you're going to be privy to very confidential information confidential information about students' health issues, about disciplinary issues, about ad district placements, about staff members' medical issues, discipline, etc. Just go to great lengths to protect it. The only people you should have any discussion with about that closed session are yourself in closed session and Dr. LaSusa and your BA, and that's it. And it never leaves the confines of, of that world to anybody until the matter is no longer uh, confidential. And if it's a student record, that means never. Um, if it's, you know, you're going to file tenure charges against a teacher, well, ultimately, once you file the charges, that becomes a public record, like the case I told you about in Patterson. But you can't discuss it while, that, while the, the issue's ongoing. And we're not immune, right? We have been sued. We have had to pay. We have had our board members have had their emails opened. Absolutely. So I just you didn't bet. want people to think yeah. we're immune. We, we, you're not. This past year, our emails were opened. Um, we've been sued, so it comes right out of the district budget, so we just have to be very yep. cognizant of that. And, 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 you, and, and while you have insurance, you have a deductible. So the district is responsible for the deductible um, before you even get into your insurance level. And I can tell you, lawsuits, they're not fun. I mean, they're, they're, they're very caustic, they're very time-consuming, and you as board members don't want to have to be deposed and things like that. So it's very easy to avoid the problems, and it's just stop, think, before you hit send on an email, is this going to offend anybody? Is this appropriate? And just be mindful that when you have information and you're wondering whether or not somebody makes an inquiry, talk to Dr. LaSusa. Is this something that, that you're aware of? Can you address this? And there's no problem. Dr. LaSusa would then call up the person and say, uh, Ms. Weber, just let me know that you had a concern about X. I'm addressing it. And then Dr. LaSusa will call back Ms. Weber and say, I called so-and-so, and I've addressed the issue for you. And that's the whole goal, is to try to insulate you, you, you as board members from the day-to-day -day operations so that you don't get yourselves in 
those ethical dilemmas. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any additional questions? Okay. I just, out of curiosity, in terms of the, for the e for sending the email, I understand the importance of using the, um, the school. Um, but doesn't the business administrator have access to all the sent and received so that if I send something from my personal email, he's receiving it on the school website? So isn't it, I mean, um, I mean, it would be, it, it, I could see it being a problem if I sent it to a private email. Yes, yeah, so that's where the problem is, is that, that he wouldn't know if you would then communicate with somebody else to their private email. That's what happened in this case, is there was private emails going back and forth about an, an issue. Okay. So if you're having a communication with a private, but it's touching on the school, it's still a governmental record. That's where it becomes imperative. If everything is just to and from, you set up a Gmail account, and you're using that dedicated to just communicate with the school back and forth, right. it likely will be captured. Okay. But it's, it's frankly better for you, and it, it, I would strongly recommend that you never mix your business with your board work because there's not too many employers that will be real keen. And I, I had another case actually where a subpoena came in. It was in a lawsuit, and they had a subpoena, the business records. It was a national bank. That did not work out well for that board. That board member was off that board so fast, the bank said, you have, a, you have an option. You either have a job or you can be on the board. What do you like? <laughs> um, so you, just, you have to be m mindful of that. And that we run under the committee structure. So we have, you know, small committees, members of four. They gather, they talk, you know, bad ideas fall to the wayside. Good ideas get presented to the full board for voting on one way or the upper, up or down. Um, traditionally, we've always said, you know, if you're, you know, I'll use Mary again. Um, you know, if Mary comes and she's on the curriculum committee, we've always said that, you know, run your questions or run your requests to the committee to ensure that they all agree with the request. Don't send Karen Chase off, for example, on, a, on an assignment or a task without the rest of the committee either agreeing right. to it or voting on it. Is that a fair? That, that's, that's absolutely a great idea. I mean, committee Don't structures any, tend, to be very, tend to be more efficient than a, board, a committee of the whole. Committee of the whole, certain boards do a committee of the whole where the whole board gets together to deal with all the committee issues and it, you get nothing done. When you have a committee structure, policy, curriculum, negotiations, um, I don't know if you have finance and facilities. And what you should do is if a board member has a specific issue, they should direct it to the committee, especially if they want to change a policy, they want to address a facility issue, etc. You bring it to the committee. Then if the four members of that committee say, yeah, that's a great idea, they'll bring it to the full board. If the four members of the committee say, that doesn't sound like such a great idea, that's the, they'll, they'll let you as a board member individually know that. Um, and it doesn't mean that you can't bring it up at a public meeting, mm -hmm. but you, you should always work through the committee structure. And the reason you have committees is you don't want to have eight board members doing eight different things. You have one committee of four doing one thing, et cetera, and it makes it more efficient, and then it's that committee's job to report back to the full board for the board to take official action. And ultimately, the committee working, and most of your committees work with, if it's finance facilities, you're working with your professionals that you've hired, whether it's Dr. LaSusa, Peter D'Aquila, to give you guys the committee guidance on what you can and can't do, whether it's you know crafting the budget, whether it's going out for a bond referendum, whether it's changing curriculum. You just talked about it just before, about the, the, the whole um, redistricting issue. Mm -hmm. That's going to probably come through a committee and then ultimately report to the board, et cetera. So it makes it a much more efficient process to, to work through the committees. Okay. Matt, this doesn't have to do with school ethics, but could you just touch on HIB, the basic tenets of the, tenets of the HIB law? And yeah, so the, the, um, the New Jersey legislature... Um, several years ago passed a law, uh, HIB, which is Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying. And the best way I can describe it is, is that all adults, when you go to work at any employer in New Jersey, you have mandatory sexual harassment training, workplace harassment training. Uh, most employers have handbooks that say that if you do X, there's got to be an investigation and remedial action. And that's gone on for years and years and years. They didn't have anything like that for students. So the legislature, using the, the very similar analysis to what's under the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination, crafted the Harassment, Intimidation, and Bullying Law. And basically, it's to prevent students from being <coughs> harassed, intimidated, and bullying based on 
um, a protected ca category or a perceived category. So what are the protected categories? Race, religion, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability. Now the har harassment, intimidation, and bullying law goes even a little bit broader than that and it looks at positions of, you know, characteristics, etc. And so if a child is being harassed or intimidated or bullied, given, let's use an example, based on their race, and it's coming from another student, and it adversely affects the victims, um, it has an impact on them in school, that would constitute harassment, intimidation, and bullying. And the law is very, very strict. When a complaint comes in, it can come from a student, it can come from a parent, it can come from a staff member. When it comes in, the district has 10 days to not only initiate the investigation, but conclude it. And once the investigation is concluded, the, each um, district has to have what's known as billing specialists that do the investigation. And they'll make it an initial finding. A, whether it was harassment, intimidation, and bullying, or B, it wasn't. And ultimately, it goes up through the principal to Dr. LaSusa, who can either accept or reject those findings. They'll review the, the, the investigation. And the investigation has interviews of all the students involved. It might be now it's texts, Facebook posts, YouTubes, Snapchats. All that will be contained. And Dr. LaSusa will have to make a decision of whether or not he agrees that it constitutes or does not constitute harassment, intimidation, or bullying. At that point, you as the board, the parents can appeal to you as the board to seek to overturn Dr. LaSusa's findings. And if they're dissatisfied with you, they can appeal to the Commissioner of Education for a trial before an administrative law judge on harassment, intimidation, and bullying. The whole purpose of it is they want people to be nice. You don't have to love everybody. You don't have to be friends with everybody. But you've got to be nice and kind to people. And... Uh, there's really very little tolerance, there's no tolerance for people who bully other kids. And um, there's consequences, not only disciplinary consequences, but there's also uh, in terms of training and trying to redirect these kids, because the whole goal of this law really is, if kids are acting badly when they're in second, third, fourth grade, let's see if we can teach them how to behave appropriately. A lot easier to teach a kid to behave appropriately than it is to, to change a 35-year-old male's inappropriate behavior in the workplace. And you can see what's happened all over our nation in terms of inappropriate behavior. It's basically the same thing at the level for students. But it can be teacher on student, student on student, and it doesn't have to occur in school. And this is where it becomes very, very difficult is a lot of this bullying occurs, guess where, over Facebook, over Twitter, over emails, outside of school, on a Saturday, at a party, but then on Monday when it comes in, everyone will say, hi, did you see that Facebook post about Mike LaSusa? Did you? And then all of a sudden it involves the school. So it, 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 it's, a, it's a very broad law. It's having, I think, very profound effects to try to minimize uh, harassment, intimidation, and bullying. I can tell you I have four kids that have gone through school, two in school now, and I can tell you from my 24-year-old to my 13-year-old, there's a marked difference in the way kids are treating one another in terms of their sexual orientation, their religion, their ethnicity uh, in schools, and I think a lot of it is our, our law, the harassment, intimidation, and bullying law. But there's a lot of parents, that you, a lot of the appeals that you will get as a board will be, parents will come to you, and they're not denying that their kids said these horrific things or inappropriate things or posted it. They just don't want the bullying label in the student file. And what I tell parents is that's not a basis to appeal. You can appeal it, but under both state and federal law, student files are absolutely confidential. We can't reveal them to anybody. Now, a lot of parents are concerned that uh, on college applications, certain colleges might ask if you've been found guilty of harassment, intimidation, and bullying, well, that's for you and your, your child to fill out, honestly. Um, but it should be an encouragement for all parents to say, make sure that you're not a bully or a harasser or an intimidator in school because that could have an adverse consequence on you if you want to get into you know, college one day.
And so that's what you as a board said. And it's very, very important for you guys not to get involved in that because in that instance, when you look at student disciplinary cases, when you look at um, cases involving teacher discipline, you ultimately sit as a quasi-judicial body. So let's say, Mike Lasusa, you have an HIV case. You have to make the determination as a board as a whole, are you going to accept, reject, or modify Dr. Lasusa's findings in a given HIV? So you could actually override Dr. Lasusa. Within Same, the law. What? Within the law. Within the law. Same thing when you're dealing with, uh, you know, employee discipline. If you have a situation where Dr. Lasusa wants to file tenure charges, ultimately they're filed with you, and the board has to look at, the, at Dr. Lasusa's sworn statement of evidence and the employees and make the determination: Are we sending this to the Commissioner of Education? So that's why it's also you're not involved in, in the day-to-day -day operations because very often you as a board member sit in a quasi-judicial capacity where you're going to be making a decision based on what Ms. Dr. Lasusa has done on a given day or in a given instance. Okay, well thank you. It's a lot to absorb. <clears throat> I'm sure Mike and Mary are thinking, well, what did I sign up for? Mr. Barn is saying I'm happy I got out in time. But um, we don't have to call this the end. If you guys have additional questions, we can have Matt, come back again. We can do a deeper dive into a particular item. If we need to get deeper into HIV, we'll do that. If we need to get into rice, whatever topics that you know you think we need a deeper dive in, we'll just have Matt come back. And again, and if there's any any individual issue that you're concerned with, just yep. pick up the phone to Dr. Lasusa. He'll reach out to me, and we'll give you an opinion right away, and give you guidance on what you should or shouldn't do. And most of these things are not. We've seen it over and over again, so we can give you guidance to so you don't get yourself in trouble. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for Thank coming you. out. Happy Thank New Year. Matt. Appreciate it. Happy New Year. We'll see you again soon, hopefully not too soon. Okay, so we're going to move on with the uh, regular agenda. Peter, you were good, right? You were done with your report? Yes, you're up to committee reports. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, committee reports, Ms. Kenny, on personnel. We have not met uh, since the last meeting, and um, since. Uh, I don't know when, I don't know actually since it's the new reorg. I don't know yeah, we don't, I don't know if the meetings are published yet. Um, we did have a curriculum meeting just before this meeting, so Anne, would you be able to talk on that a little bit? Sure. Um, yes, we did meet just before this meeting. Um, we spoke with um, a few of the counselors, one at the high school and one at the middle school, in terms of um, kind of what they will be discussing at the open curriculum meeting on February 5th. 5th? 5th. Correct. Um, so that stuff kind of will be made public during that meeting and, you know, we just discussed some of the things that are going on in the district and, and things that they are, um, you know, aware of and taking control of as best they can. And things we want parents to, you know, Absolutely. get on board. Which is why that public meeting is going to be so important. So parents, please spread the word. Anybody who uh, is here tonight, make sure you spread the word to the other parents to please come to that meeting. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Matt, finance and facilities? Um, the committee met on December the 11th. Um, a number of the topics Pete already addressed, and which is include the demographer report as well as the uh, updates on um, the construction of the middle school, Milton Avenue, et cetera. Um, there was one issue in terms of the Cooper Field project, just going through the final punch list. Uh, there was one thing that needed to be addressed, which was a corner fence issue at the Madison border, which I assume by now has been addressed. Um, and now we're scary as it seems. We're moving into the budget items for 2018-19, uh, where the administration is addressing staff, um, as well as the capital spending dollars. Uh, basically, those are the items that we will address on a uh, singular basis over the summer. Um, as you can imagine, uh, there was a significant amount of discussion from the staffing perspective and looking at the feasibility to increase di district staff um, so will that all be addressed as we move towards the budget process? And then, Mike, now because of the vote change, these votes are done. We have to approve a budget is May, June? Uh, the preliminary budget will go to the county office in March, and the board approves it uh, end of April, beginning of May. The, yeah, the approval process didn't change with the vote change. <clears throat> we still are beholden to the same timeline as before. Yes. Okay. All right. So everyone on the board is remember and understand that we need to uh, come up with a dollar figure in terms of the tax that we're willing to uh, approve from a tax increase perspective. 
Okay. And you'll hold some pu public meetings as well? Yes, we will. Public finance, okay. Any questions for Mr. Gilfillan on any of the finance or facilities items? Seeing none. Um, policy and planning has not met. Uh, Mr. Arnock is going to head that up going forward. Uh, hopefully, Mr. Connors left you in good shape, but, you know, who knows? You did. Am I allowed to claim to be chairman like he did? If yes. you'd like. If you really want to. <laughs> if you want, Mr. You chairman. <laughs> Um, so more to follow on policy and planning as we restructure the committees. Um, just a word on the committees for the new, the new members. They're, they're somewhat fluid. All of us on the, on the board work, so a lot of times our schedule, even if you're assigned to a particular committee, you will more than likely, I can guarantee, you will sit on all of them throughout the year um, because there's an alternate for each committee, and then sometimes the alternate committee, and we might just send a, hey, who's available at 6.30 to cover personnel? So mm -hmm. if you're available, great. If not, we certainly understand, but... Uh, while we have assigned people to committees, it's a little fluid because of our schedules. Uh, moving on to liaison reports, I'm going to be the no borough council, probably be my most challenging role liaison. Um, currently, there's nothing to report from the borough. <laughs> um, township, Ms. Clark is not here. Uh, Boosters and Ciccarelli, um, if you're okay taking that over, I know the, they don't meet until tomorrow night, the athletic boosters. Um, we can share that. We could share that task. I was doing PTO just with that, but that's okay. It's all good. Say that again. I'm sorry. I said I thought I was doing PTO just for cabinet, but I can do, I can certainly do boosters. Yeah, only for like a week or two, and then we're going to talk Mary Chambers into it. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, and performing arts, Mr. Arnock, any reports? Uh, sure. Thank you, Jill. Uh, the final concerts of the season are wrapping up. One is tonight, and one is uh, the, the Chatham High School Band is at the Chatham Middle School, because of obviously the construction of the auditorium, at 7.30 on Wednesday. So that is the last concert of the holiday season. Uh, I want to mention a few other things. Uh, the New Jersey Governor's Awards and Theater Competition was held on Saturday, January 6th at Montclair State. Seven Chatham High School actors placed in the top five in their categories. I just want to mention their names and give them a little credit. Grace Peterson, fifth place in comedy monologues. James Maltby and Lily Bauer, fourth place in dramatic pairs. Charlie Thompson and Owen Lachance, third place in improvisational pairs. And Elizabeth Stewart and Mikey Bear won first place and the government's the governor's award for improvisational pairs. So that's that's really substantial and, and, and noteworthy, and I want to bring that up. Uh, I also want to um, remind everyone that the Chatham Middle School will present Willy Wonka Jr., and I'm going to give you the dates, January 18th at 6, the 19th and 20th, both at 7 p.m. in the Middle School Auditorium. It's directed by Jason Stiles. Uh, Tickets are $6 each, and they'll be available in the Chatham Middle School main office after 3 p.m. starting this Thursday or before each show. These shows are always fantastic. Uh, I have one boy who's, who's graduating college, but he was involved in theater back in middle school, and it took him right through high school. And it, it's not only acting. These kids don't go and become actors. They go and, and become scientists, but they learn how to communicate. They learn how to um, work under pressure. They learn how to be team players. Uh, and it starts, in, in, when you, and you see it come and gel together in these middle school productions, and it's fantastic. Uh, two final things. Broadway Under the Stars is the Chatham Performing Arts Booster's largest fundraising event, and it takes place Friday, February 2nd at 7.30 in the Chatham High School cafeteria. Tickets can be purchased in advance or at the door, $20 for the general public, $10 for student and staff, uh, and it's free for board members. I'm just kidding. No, he's not here. <laughs> Please support it. It's a wonderful night. And the Chatham Performing Arts Boosters will have its next meeting Wednesday, February 7th at 7 p.m. in the Lafayette Lounge. All are welcome to join. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Sal. I appreciate it. Uh, Lada for Chatham Education Foundation? Uh, there's nothing to report it at this time. Excellent. Mr. Gilfillan for nothing. recreation? Nothing. And the PTO District Cabinet meeting hasn't met. Have they? Yes, we met last week. How'd that go? Um, How'd it, go? it went great. We discussed uh, the new year, and um, we did talk a little bit about redistricting. I'll be visiting uh, pretty much all the PTOs beginning tomorrow morning and talking about college um, admissions process and 
kind of piggybacking on what you saw when Doug Walker came in about just having a broader um, perspective when considering uh, college admissions and what schools to look at and that kind of thing. You're going to talk about that at Milton Avenue? Yes. So I gave a presentation similar to the, some of the ones that we've seen. Um, I'm getting stressed out just thinking about it. So yeah. The, no, the, so I uh, gave a presentation like I did last at the end of last year to the PTO this year. And the feedback was we wish that we knew this when we uh, had kids who were much younger. Okay. And it would have reduced a lot of the anxiety and the stress about keeping up and trying to enroll in four honors classes as early as we possibly can. So we really want you to come to our schools to talk about this stuff at an earlier age. Right. So I'm going to hit all of the elementary schools. And again, just to reiterate about not having to be Correct. 30 AP classes, Correct. not having to be in Correct. honors from the fourth grade on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for any of the liaisons or committee, mem committee chairs? Um, very good. I'd like to make a motion to move the public and executive session me minutes from the December 11th meeting. Second. Peter, could you tell me who? I Matt was not here. Okay, very good. Could you do a roll Sure, the uh, public and executive minutes from December 11th. Mr. Gilfillan? Abstain. Mr. Arnick? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Abstain. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Abstain. Yes. You weren't here. I wasn't there. Abstain. Excuse me. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda was passed uh, 503. Excellent. Very good. I know it was a long time coming, but we do have our first opportunity for public commentary. Um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and coming up to this side and sign in and um, let us know what your concerns are. If nothing strikes your fancy now, there'll be another opportunity at the end, so okay, no pressure. We'll go on with the regular agenda and then circle back to the <coughs> second public commentary. Um, so we're going to go with the old committee structure for the moment. So for personnel, Anne, would you mind moving the personnel items? Sure. I'd like to move action items uh, A1 through A12 on your regular agenda as, I'm sorry, A1 through A14 on your regular agenda as well as item A6 on the addendum. Just a small note that uh, Ms. Braun, <coughs> Ms. Braun, who's listed under uh, A1, is a paraprofessional, been with us for 20 years, so we wish her the best. She's actually retiring, not resigning. Hey, Jill, does, uh, do Mike and Mary abstain for these? Uh, no. Okay. Nope, all on board. They heard the sh Ms. Mm. Matt's fire and brimstone. I mean, they can if they choose, sorry, um, but they do not have to. Thank you, Sal, for asking the question, though. Does anybody have any questions? Nobody for... seconded it. Nobody seconded it? <laughs> yeah. I'll do it. I'll be the new guy. Excellent. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Lasuso or Ms. Grant on anything related to personnel? Anything on the agenda or otherwise? Seeing none, Peter, would you mind? Your agenda items A1 through A14 with A6 updated on the addendum and uh, A1 corrected to know the retirement. Mr. Gilfillan? Yes. Mr. Onik? Yes. Ms. Chickarelli? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Uh, abstain. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Abstain. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 602. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, finance and facilities, Mr. Gilfellan? Yes, like move action items B1 through 13 on your regular agenda. Second. A um, couple things. A lot of um, small donations. Uh, one from the Work Family Connection, the amount of 250 bucks for the scholarship fund for the seniors. Um, question on, on number eight. Uh, remember we did this probably two meetings ago. Is this the second donation? Actually, the third. Third. Okay. Yes. Well, did he this have, this gentleman questions? from the uh, preferred freezer has donated close to thirty thousand dollars in the last. Thank you, Mr. I'm going to say here, eight weeks. Wow. And um, all going into the step. So he's awesome. um, unbelievable. That is unbelievable. Uh, the robotics team, I guess, kind of associated with this, has got a, a grant from the Arcanic Foundation, no matter one thousand dollars. Joe Weber, once again. 
steps up to the plate with another matching donation from Check. Bank of America. Uh, yeah, Bank of America. Well, you said it, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. No, no, you're good. Oh, and then uh, last but least of the Pfizer Foundation matching gift, 300 bucks toward Lafayette School. Excellent. Does anybody have any questions on the finance and facilities or anything from Mr. DeQuilla or Matt? Seeing none, Peter, would you mind? Sure, agenda items B1 through B13. Mr. Gilfillan? Yes. Mr. Otto? Yes. Mr. Cicerelli? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Abstain. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Abstain. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 602. Okay, Peter, could you make a note that uh, Michelle is not here, so Ms. Kenny is going to move the curriculum. Ms. Kenny, would you mind? Yes, I would like to move action item C1 to C3 for vote. Not a lot to talk about there. Any questions on the overnight field trip? Nope. Seeing none, Peter? Sure. Agenda item C1 to C3. Mr. Gilfillan? Yes. Mr. Onik? Yes. Ms. Ciccarelli? Yes. Ms. Chambers? Abstain. Ms. Kenny? Yes. Mr. Ryan? Yes. Mr. Valenti? Yes. And Ms. Weber? Yes. Agenda items passed 701. Excellent. Uh, policy, we have no no items to pass or discuss currently. Uh, board business, I just have a quick question, and if anybody else has any additional items, jump in. Uh, the calendars that you've sent out, any results yet? Um, they close on the this Friday, okay. but I sent out a reminder last Friday. Um, I did have one parent contact me today and um, ask if we had considered on the calendar, it was calendar number three, I believe, where we had a full week off in February. Mm -hmm. If we would consider having a full week off in February and then no spring break and just a long weekend, Friday, Monday. In April? Um, in April. Wait, who asked you that? A parent. A parent. Oh. So I said I would share it with you. I wasn't, you know, since you asked, I'll, I just mentioned, uh, I yeah. mentioned it. So if you want me to, you know, try to put something together for your consideration for the next board meeting when we plan to adopt the calendar, I could do that. Yeah, no, not at this time. I'd like to go with the calendars that we put out there since okay. December. Yep. Um, we could look at that. A lot of times the teachers want, would like the break in February to get the schools cleaned out, germs, kids are sick. No. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's just a sad fact of, of winter, the flu season. Um, a lot of the juniors and a lot of the high schoolers use the April break for college visits and things like that. Um, but so not because we've already put these calendars out since December. Sure, I'm understood. Just to go with the current vote. Does anybody disagree with that? Anybody okay with that? Good. Good with that. Um, any additional board business that anybody would like to bring up? No, nope, seeing none. Very good. We have our second opportunity for public commentary. Um, if you would just orderly li line up at the podium. There we go. <laughs> if you would just introduce yourself, that would be great. Good evening, Bill Heap. John and Burrow. Um, congratulations to all the board members, the new ones. Uh, easy business first. Uh, we, the JCs, had a sellout this year at our Christmas tree sale. How about yeah. that? A week before Christmas. So every last tree was sold. Funds will be distributed sometime uh, in the fall. Uh, excuse me, in the spring, this coming spring. Uh, I brought a copy of the Wall Street Journal with me. Uh, today's edition. One of the uh, headlines is investors prod Apple on child iPhone use. Um, I have always been suspicious of Silicon Valley's power. I don't like it. Uh, I don't have a Facebook account, a Twitter account, a Snapchat account, and I have a flip phone. Uh, we didn't allow our kids to have cell phones until they were 16. That took a lot <laughs> because we were called all sorts of nasty names. Um, and I cringe when I see middle schoolers and young high schoolers walking around with their faces buried in their phones. Uh, so I guess the blowback is beginning to occur. And I certainly would, um, uh, I hope it goes further. I hope that uh, something occurs because I just don't think it's, uh, it's great that um, kids walk around with uh, cell phones that seem to be attached to their, uh, to their hands. Anyway, others may disagree. Um, the uh, last thing I'd like to say is I would hope the board 
can make some New Year's resolutions. And two of those resolutions should be, number one, to do something about health care. Uh, easier said than done, I understand that, but uh, to have the taxpayers uh, incur 22% increases, uh, that's just simply not sustainable. And so I would encourage you to do whatever you can to try and keep uh, rein in those costs. Uh, the second thing I would like you to do is to bring back the vote. Uh, we have lost any leverage that we have with regard to any of these kinds of things, with regard to negotiation, uh, and we are helpless. All we can do is sit by as you pass the costs through. Uh, it might be nice to be able to send a signal, um, and so bringing back that vote would enable us to send a signal. Thank you. Mr. Heat, may I ask you a question? Yes. Are you also going to the town councils, the state legislation, and the federal government to ask to return their vote, to get a vote on that as well? My concern is if, um, you know, you want the power put back in and you vote no on the school budget, it really doesn't solve all the problems. It just makes us have to fire 40 teachers. So my concern is there's no other budget that's being voted on. And, sorry if I may, we still are beholden to the 2% cap. Anything over the 2% has to go to the voters for public, for a public vote and approval, yes or no, up or down. And then, you know, let's say we need 2.8%. Voters say, no way, not doing it, take your 2%, and that's it, do what you need to do. So be it. But we're still beholden to the 2% cap. That cap does not include health care costs, though. There's, um, there's some waivers, but it, 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 we can't go to 22% and just say, you know. I understand that. You, but last, uh, I think last go-around, you got about three and a quarter without trying too hard. And that's pretty good. Uh, and a lot of that was, was health care costs. Yeah, we still and, have to pay health care, we still have to pay salaries, I agree. And I think that you have gone from, we're no longer providing our teachers with health insurance. We are simply providing them with health care. It's, it's basically dollar for dollar at this point. Uh, and, and maybe there's a year lag. But when you have that dollar for dollar and you buy coverage, uh, whatever your rating experience is the following year, you pay up. Nothing is for free. So um, I'm not sure. Maybe the, uh, the money that the teachers pay in, and this is an idea you can shoot down. I'm just uh, throwing it out there. Uh, maybe they should be able to keep that money and use that uh, to pay deductibles. And if they had that in their own hands, uh, they might attempt to save more of it. And I, I don't know what the, uh, uh, Mr. DeQuilla sent me the, um, uh, the facts and figures on health care, and the employees pay a certain portion of it, uh, and it gets taken directly out of their paycheck. They don't see that. It's, I understand that people know that it goes to health care, but it's not actually in their hands. Maybe if they had it in their hands and had to use it to pay first dollar costs with the incentive of being able to save some of it, maybe that might help. I don't know. It's a tricky situation. I don't uh, say otherwise. Uh, but at 22% a year, that's tough. The rest of us are getting slammed uh, with regard to health care. Okay. Thank you, thank you Bill. Thank Happy you. New Year. Any additional uh, public commentary? No? Seeing none, I make a, make a motion to close the public session. I do not believe we have an executive session anymore. No? We're good? Next time. Somebody second in the closure? Next time. Second. 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 All in favor? Next time. Aye. We will, it's been postponed until the 5th, correct? Correct.